What I want to do this morning is take a look at uh, a very well-known story, right? The Exodus story. We're all familiar with the Exodus story. And I, I want to take a look at some pictures for us about our journey as we look at the journey that God has the children of Israel on. And hopefully we'll see some really cool things that many of us might already know, but it'll be a good reminder. And some of us that maybe are newer in the Lord will learn uh, about the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the leading, the guiding, the salvation, the forgiveness, the transformation, and all those things that we have in our God. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, tells us that the things that are written about the Israelites and their journey with God are there for our admonition, for our instruction, right? They're examples for us. So we're going to look at some of the things that we want to learn from the way the Israelites, the children of Israel, relate to God and how God relates to them both. And so, you know the Exodus story, right? God raises up a deliverer. His name is Moses. He tells him to go to Pharaoh, and he tells him to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And the, and the Pharaoh says, I don't even know who the Lord is. Why would I let them go? And so you know the story, right? His heart is hard, and so he begins to bring the plagues. The, 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 the river is turned into blood, and then the frogs and the lice and the flies and all the cattle are or killed all the livestock in, in Egypt. And, the f and then, of course, the boils and the hail and the locusts. And then utter darkness. That's plague number nine. And then, after that, Pharaoh says, get out from me. And don't come back. If you come back, you'll surely die. And Moses says, okay, you said well. He said, but one more thing. At midnight tonight, plague 10. The firstborn in all of Egypt will be destroyed. Your children and your livestock. And then, of course, God tells Moses to tell the children of Israel to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. And he will pass over their home so that none, their, <coughs> none of their firstborn or anything will be destroyed in, in the Israelite camp. But of the Egyptians, of course, the firstborn livestock and of their families. And there's weeping and there's crying out and there's wailing that night. And then God delivers them from 430 years of bondage. He sets them free. All right? And because of the blood of the lamb, he passed over that night. And that was essentially their salvation experience which is a picture, of course, as we know, of our salvation experience. We were all <coughs> dead in trespasses and sins, right? We, were, we walked according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air who works in the sons of disobedience. That's who we were, and that's the state we were in when we came to Christ. And then he delivered us from bondage, from slavery. And he set us free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. He set us free to serve him, to walk with him, to follow him. And that's exactly what he does for Israel here in, in a more physical sense, right? He sets them free. He delivers them from slavery. And out they go. And now they're on their journey. And it's interesting, you know, God provided for their journey. He, he told them to go and ask for silver and gold and clothing from the Egyptians, and the scripture says they plundered the Egyptians. <laughs> they gave them everything. Here, just go. Here's our silver. Here's our gold. And God provided everything they needed for their journey. And so they, they go out. And there's 600,000 men plus women and children. There's probably 2 million plus that go out. Could you imagine that? An army of 2 million people that are set free now and they go out. Look how they've multiplied. And they go out. And they journey from Ramses to Sukkoth. And there, God has them camped. That's their first stop. And that's where he puts the regulations on the Passover as a solemn observance every year, right? He sets all the regulations and he establishes the yearly 
uh, remembrance of the way that God delivered them from bondage and from slavery. And then in verse 17 of chapter 13, look what it says. It says, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt, they, uh, they will see war and return to Egypt, rather. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness, by the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So here's two million people, and now they're traveling, right? And God's taking them from uh, Sukkoth, and he's going to take them to Etam. Etam, by the way, means with us or with them. And God's going to show them how he really is with them. It says in verse 20, they took their journey from Sukkoth, encamped in Etam at the edge of the wilderness, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the, lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light as, uh, so they could see where they're going, in other words. And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire, fl- uh, fire by night. And so God is showing them his presence, and he's leading them and guiding them by his presence. Cloud by day, fire by night. It's interesting, you know, they're, they're going through the wilderness on a specific route that God has them on. It's very important. God's taking them on his route. This is the way he wants them to go. He's leading them. He's guiding them. And, and, they're, and they're in the wilderness. Wilderness doesn't mean forest, trees, and streams. It means desert. Very few trees, very little water, and really hot it gets up over 100 degrees frequently in the desert. And so it's interesting that God's leading them by the day in this, in this pillar of cloud. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that all, they all walk under the cloud, right? In other words, God provided this cloud during the day as like shelter as they walked in the heat. Notice his provision through all of this. Snapshots, pictures of how God provides and meets our needs and leads us and guides us. And then, of course, by night, he gives them a pillar of light so they could see where they're going. He's with them. His presence is with them. He leads us today, doesn't he, by his spirit and by his word. When, When we come to Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. He's our teacher. He's our guide. He's our helper. He's really everything we need. This is the spirit of Christ who lives inside of us. And he guides us and he leads us. And, of course, he also leads us by his word, right? Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, God is doing the same thing today for us that he did for them, a little bit differently, but in the same way. The same but different. And so he's leading them by the pillar of cloud, or by the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, and then in verse 14, chapter 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp at Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, opposite Belzephon, and you shall camp there by the sea. For Pharaoh will say, bless you, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, the wilderness has closed them in. And this isn't this interesting. I mean, God's leading and guiding, and he leads them to a place where they're trapped, essentially, right? And of course, by the way, we know the rest of the story. Here comes Pharaoh's army. And the only way out is back the way they came, but they can't because Pharaoh's army is bearing down on them. So God's got them set up. It's not very smart from our point of view, right? It's not very strategic. He's got them landlocked, basically. But he put them there for a reason. He led them there for a reason. He set this whole thing up so that he could show them a miracle. Not just them, though, also the Egyptians as well. It says in verse 4, Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army and the Egyptians. 
and they may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Right? God wants to show the Egyptians as well as the Israelites who he really is. And now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we, have we done this that we have let Israel go from our service? We lost our workforce. Why do we let them go? Let's go after them. And so he made ready his chariot and he took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and the chariots of Egypt with captains and every one of them. Now, of course, understand Egypt, you know, they've got the latest technology. They've got it all of the day, that is. They got 600 choice chariots and captains and their army. I mean, it's an absolutely no-win situation for the Israelites. They're sitting ducks. They're dead. And they're bearing down on them. And it says in verse 8, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness, so the Egyptians pursued them with all their horses and their chariots, and, the, and Pharaoh, his horsemen, and his army, uh, and overtook them, camping by the side of pi Hareth from Baal-Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they cried out to the Lord. didn't last very long, though, because in the next verse it says, Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Which is kind of a ridiculous statement. Egypt's all about graves, <laughs> right? Mummification, pyramids, you know. Uh, but notice how they're losing perspective because they're gripped with fear. Why have you dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, we should, than that we should die in a wilderness. We're all going to die. Now, okay, it's understandable to a certain extent, right? I mean, they're in a no-win situation. Here comes Pharaoh's army. He's bearing down on them. And God is trying to teach them who he is and reveal himself to him in many different ways. He's already done a couple miracles, right? Passed over their house. He delivered them. Pillar of cloud by day, fire at night. You know, he sees them at work and moving, but he's about to show them who he really is, right? And so in verse... 13, it says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand till and see the salvation of the Lord. Stop, in other words. Just stop and watch what the Lord's going to do. How many times have any one of us been gripped with fear? A and when we're gripped with fear like this, ult ultimately, what are we talking about? The fear of the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's next. I don't know if I'm going to live or die. How many situations does God allow us to be in in life where we find ourselves in that very situation? And when you're gripped with fear, what happens? You begin to lose perspective. All right? And, you, and everything you think is skewed. And you imagine all kinds of things that are never going to happen. I think... 90% of the things we imagine when we're gripped with fear and panic will never happen. But what if this? And what is that? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? And that's the state they're in right now. But here's the thing. If you know God, if you walk with God, you know, even though you don't know, you know that he's in control, right? And so when you come to a place that you do not know, fear of the unknown, it's important to fall back on what you do know. When you come to a place that you don't know, it's important to fall back on what you do know. And if you know God, you can fall back and you can realize, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but what do I know about God? He's the one true and living God, creator of heaven and earth and all that is in it. He created me in his image, as, as John prayed earlier. Am I going to trust him as we sang earlier? Am I going to trust in Jesus? Am I going to trust 
that he's got it, even though I have no idea what's going to happen next. See, that's the thing. It's all about the knowing. It's all about the knowing. If you don't know God, what do you have to fall back on? You come to a situation where you don't know, what are you going to fall back on? Nothing, if you don't know Jesus. Nothing. All you can do is be gripped by fear and panic. But they come to this place, and God's about to show them who he really is. And Moses says, don't be afraid, stand still. In other words, stop and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more again, forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. I I think Moses probably wants to say, and you shall shut up. Stop it already. But he's going to fight your battles. God fights our battles. And then in the next verse, it says, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So, you know, and, I'm, and in verse 15, God says and to, to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children, children of Israel to go forward and then stretch out your hand. You know, there's a time to pray and there's a time to take action, right? God's saying, don't, don't cry to me anymore. Move forward. Stretch out your hand. And watch what I'm going to do. The children will go, by, go through the, the sea on dry ground. You know, I've, I've talked to many people over the years in counseling. And, you know, it's funny when people say, yeah, I think I'm going to pray about that. And I, and I open up the Bible and I say, I don't think you need to pray about that. God's already spoken about that. It's time to take action. There's a time to pray and there's the time to take action. And so in verse 19, look what happens here now. Well, let, let's go to verse 18 first. Then the Egyptians... Uh, shall know, God says, that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariot, and his horsemen. God's going to show the Israelites, or the Egyptians, who he is, and the Israelites too. And then it says in verse 19, and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them, or from before them and went and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus, it was a cloud and darkness to one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and he made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. This is an amazing story. And and notice, you know, that pillar of of cloud that was in front of them now moves behind them to protect them, right? And it becomes a wall between them and the Egyptians. So the Egyptians had had no choice but to stop. They couldn't move any further because they couldn't go through. They couldn't see where to go. But on the other side of that, God's giving them light so that they could go through the Red Sea on dry ground. Isn't that amazing? How many times does God protect us and we don't even know it? Think about that. I mean, we don't know what we don't know. You know, uh, in in Jesus, all things hold together. He's holding us together. He's protecting us. He's providing for us. He's doing all these things. And Many times we don't know it, and sometimes if he walks with the Lord for a while, you just take it for granted. God protects. So they go through uh, the sea on dry ground. We know the story. Many people say, well, I don't know if that's really true. It's allegorical and all these kinds of things. Well, I'm sorry if you feel that way. Uh, there's, there's plenty of evidence. There's, there's plausible explanations. I'm not going to get into any of that, but look. I take the word literally. You should too. Okay? God parted the sea, and that's all there is to it. And then it says in verse 23, the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen. And now it came to pass in the morning, uh, watch, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and the cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels. I love it so that they drove with them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us free from the face of Israel, 
For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Even they understand that God's fighting. This is a no-win situation. We've got to get out of here. But we know the rest of the story. They're not getting out of there because God brings back the sea and he, and he drowns them all and they're all dead. And in verse 30, it says, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. That must be something to see. And thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord, right? God is teaching them to fear him. Now the people are fearing the Lord and they believe the Lord and his servant Moses. Of course, as we're going to see in a minute, this doesn't last very long. But for the moment, they feared and they believed the Lord. And listen, same God yesterday, today, and forever, right? God doesn't change. Malachi 3, 6, I'm the Lord, I don't change, right? The same God that's doing these things for the children of Israel is the same God that we receive in our hearts and the same God that we follow today, right? He doesn't change. He still does miracles. He's the same God that saved and guided and led and fought for and protected Israel. And this is a great picture of the sovereignty of God. He's in control of all of this. There's no need to freak out. <laughs> He's in control. And so when you need a miracle, I mean, look, the fact that I could get saved, that's a miracle. The fact that any of us could be saved is a miracle. That's the miracle of miracles. It's funny how people, you know, uh, they trust God for salvation, but they just don't trust him with the rest of their life every day. <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? You're trusting him to deliver you from hell, but not deliver you from each situation that you find yourself in. God's teaching them, and hopefully teaching us the same thing, to trust him, whether it's in our marriages or our finances or, or, or that we need a healing because we got a diagnosis. What's the worst that can happen anyway? If I'm a believer and I die, what's the worst that could happen? To live as Christ and die is gain. I mean, come on. So God's in control. He's the one true and living God, creator of heaven and earth and all that is in it. And so we need to trust him. But see, trusting only comes by knowing. Knowing leads to trusting. And in trusting, in my, in my experience, leads to obedience. When you know him, you'll trust him, and when you trust him, you'll obey him. And that's how it works. And he's teaching Israel right now who he is so they can know him, so they can begin to trust him. And he's doing the same things in our lives. And then, of course, in chapter 15, then Moses and the children of Israel sang the song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea, the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a long song, but for the up and through 19 verses, they're singing. And then in verse 20, Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel, that's the tambourine, and all the women went out with tambourines, and they were dancing, and they were singing to the Lord. He triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. So they're all there on the seashore after this amazing miracle of God did and, and the way he delivered them from destruction. And they're singing and praising and dancing with tambourines. And here's the thing. That's all cool. And it's easy to praise God in the good times, isn't it? But, but what about in the bad times? Do we still praise him in the bad times? I mean, what if they praised him on the other side of the Red Sea? What? What if? Well, first of all, they would have spared themselves from a lot of panic, a lot of fear, freaking out. But also, you know, in our lives, people are watching us. They watch how we handle these situations and circumstances that come our way. How many times... Have, have you heard or maybe in your own life somebody say, wow, how, how come you're not freaking out in this situation or that situation? 
Well, let me tell you why. And now I got an opportunity to tell somebody. See, people notice things like that. If somebody knows you're a Christian, they're watching you. They're watching how you live your life and certainly how you handle difficult situations. And so we know that James chapter 1 says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Well, because it's in those trials that God perfects our faith. But see, this idea of having joy in trials, again, only comes from knowing God. You can't have joy. I mean, joy is different than happiness. Happiness is based on outward circumstances. Something good happened, I'm happy. Something bad happened, I'm sad. And I'm up and down. I'm happy, I'm sad. You know, based on circumstances. But joy is different than that. Joy is something that's deep within who we are. It's deep inside of us. And that's God. And so joy isn't dependent upon outward circumstances. And so regardless of what's going on out here, I can have joy in here. And people will see that. Philippians 4, 6, right? Be anxious for nothing but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God and he'll give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. He'll guard your hearts and minds. Notice the thanksgiving part. Thanksgiving's powerful. Giving of thanks, even though Pharaoh's army is bearing down on you or, or your current trial is consuming you. We're all going to go through trials. We're either on our way in, we're in, or on our way out, but we're all going to go through trials. When I, when I pray and say, God, make me more like you, I have no idea what I just prayed. But I'm probably going to have a trial or two or three or five to get me where I just prayed I want to go. I have no idea what God's going to do. But I trust him. I trust him. It's all about perspective. You know, when you're gripped with fear and you're in the midst of a trial and you're looking at your trial, you're freaking out. You know, it says back there that, you know, they, they lifted their eyes and they saw the armies of Pharaoh. They should have just kept lifting their eyes all the way up and put their eyes on God. That's the problem, right? They were looking at Pharaoh's army instead of all the way up where they should have been putting their eyes on God. That's where we needed to put our eyes. So they're on a journey, and this is a picture of our journey too. And so the journey con continues. Just like they, we are pilgrims and sojourners. We're just passing through this earth. Right? We're not going to be here that long. However long we're here, it's like a mist or a vapor. You could say we're here today, gone tomorrow in the grand scheme of things when you compare it to eternity. And so we're just passing through on our journey, and they're on a journey too. And so in verse 22, uh, it would have been nice to stay there on the shore and just sing and praise, but God's got more for them to learn. So verse 22, Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And, and you know, it, it's possible to last, to live maybe up to a week with no water, but, but really three to four days is about how long the human body can live with no water. You can go a lot longer with no food, but no water. It's been three days, and they're in the wilderness. Again, I remind you, this is not the woods. This is desert, and it's hot. And yes, they're being led by the pillar of cloud by day. So they have uh, some cooling, but they need water. And so it's interesting how God brings them from this, this time of jubilation on the shores, a mountaintop experience, down into a valley now, right? Down into another difficult time. <laughs> interesting how it works. But remember, God's leading. He's in control. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, right? He has a plan. He's taking them on an unusual route. They're off the trade route, but they're on God's route. They're going the way he wants them to go. And what's ultimately the goal? Transformation. Conforming them, right? Transforming them. He wants to get 
you know, they got, he delivered them out of Egypt, which is a picture of the world, but now he wants to get the world out of them, right? He's working in them. Like it says in Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, right? He's doing that work in them as they're going on this, tr- on this journey, and he wants to do the same with us. So he's trying to teach them. He's not going to let them die. We'll see that in a moment, but he's trying to teach them to depend on him, to thirst for him. Water, yes, you need it, but thirst for me too. So two million people dying of thirst, right? And then in verse 23, it says, Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Marah means bitter. And you could just imagine. Get get the scene here now. Two million people. I mean, that's a herd. That's a gang. That's That's a lot of people marching through the wilderness And suddenly, up front, somebody sees some water. And I'm sure very quickly it started rumbling through the crowd. There's water up front. There's water up front. And I bet the people up front, they'd probably start running. Maybe everybody starts running. And I bet the people that got there first just jumped in the water if it was deep enough. And then they're like, oh, man, this is bitter. The water's bitter. Could you imagine that? And so now they're really going to die. We're all going to die. We can't even drink this water. What a cruel joke. But remember, God led them to the bitter water. He arranged all of this because he's about to show them yet another aspect of who he is. Why does God lead them? Why does God lead us into bitter times and bitter circumstances? Well, because that's where we grow, really. I mean, we, we... We mainly grow in the bad times, in the difficult times, in the trials, in the bitter experiences. That's where God really reveals himself to us. That's where he shows us who he is, and that's where we really grow. We don't grow so much in the good times. We grow in the difficult times. Look, I'm not praying for a trial. But God's going to allow them because I know that that's the only way I'm going to grow. Maras, bitter times, are just a normal part of our Christian experience, our Christian walk. You could say, and many have said, disappointments are God's appointments. There's no coincidences, right? All things work together for the good, right? The problem is in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it says all things work together for the good for those who love God and are called to his purpose, we stop there and we forget about verse 29. And what does verse 29 say? whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That's Jesus Christ. See, all things are working together for the good in the process of the transforming and conforming us into the image of Christ. That's the thing. That's what God wants to do. He wants to purify us. He wants to make us more like his son. He wants to clear out the dross, and he wants to make us more and more and more like Jesus. And there's only one way it's going to really happen. And there are no shortcuts. It's a journey. It's a walk. We're all in that process. And this is a great picture of that. And so, you know, they come to the bitter water. And then in verse 24, the people complained, imagine that, against Moses saying, what shall we drink? So three days ago, they're singing and dancing and praising, and now they're complaining. How soon they forget, how soon we forget, right? I mean, God does something amazing. And just some days later, we find ourselves in situations and, and, and many, many times our, our go-to is to complain. I wish I could stand here and say, I never complain. What's your problem? But I do. And then I have to, ask God to forgive me and to get my eyes on him again and remember. But look, God puts us through these experiences, these trials. And in the trials, we see where we're really at. Trials are like x-rays, right? They show us what's going on on the inside. 
when we're in a trial and we see how we respond in a certain situation, it shows us where we're at. And sometimes I'll be in a situation and I'll realize, hmm, I guess I, I, I need to grow some more. I'm not as far along as I thought I was maybe in that area or this area. But the good thing is God's never going to leave us or forsake us. He's never going to give up on us. And he'll always continue that transforming or that conforming process as long as we continue to walk with him, following Christ. See, it's not enough to be saved, right? Salvation's not the end. It's just the beginning. And then we start to follow. And all the rest of our life until Jesus takes us home or we die, whichever comes first, it's that process of sanctification, right? That process of, of growing us and, and conforming us and transforming us more and more into his image. How can you have joy in the midst of a trial? Well, only by knowing Christ. How can you praise instead of complain? Only by knowing Christ. It makes me think of Paul and Silas. Remember in the Philippian jail, you know, they were thrown in jail because they cast out a demon in this, uh, the demon of divination in, in this, this slave girl that was making her masters lots of money. And so they were all upset. And so they, they, they pulled in Paul and Silas. They beat them and threw them into a dungeon. And boy, if there's any other time compla to complain, there it is. But instead, at midnight, they start singing and praising God instead. And what happens? An earthquake. The doors of the jail open. The jailer, he's about to take his life because the penalty for letting your prisoners escape is death. So he figures he'll just take his own life and get it over with. And Paul says, no, don't do it. We're all here. We haven't left. And the jailer falls on his knees and says, what must I do to be saved? And he is in, and his whole household were saved and baptized that very day, right? Look what God did. And, it, and, and Paul and Silas, they had every reason to complain, but instead, just because they were praising and worshiping him, he took the whole situation, did a miracle. And so God wants to do these miracles in our lives too. Colossians chapter 3, you know, Set your mind on things above where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Don't look at the problem. Look at Jesus. All right? And so the people complained against Moses, and in verse 25, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And listen, this tree is a picture of the cross, right? 1 Peter chapter 2, 24, Galatians 3, you know, he who di dies on a tree is cursed, and so on. Jesus died on a tree. He died on the cross. But here's the thing about this tree. God showed him a tree, but you know what? It was there all along. The tree was already there. And for us, we can go to the cross anytime because the finished work of the cross is always before us. We can go to the cross. We can go to the cross over and over again. And we can receive forgiveness and refreshing and renewal and reconciliation over and over again. Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Jesus is always inviting us to come. Come. Come, come over and over and over again. Keep coming to the cross. God forgives us continually, and he fills us with himself and his forgiveness. And so, in verse 25, the bitter water is made sweet, and there God made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have bought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals. And by the way, uh, God reveals himself here to them what, once again in a new way. Jehovah Rapha. 
I'm the Lord who heals. Notice what he's doing. These are snapshots and pictures of how God works in our lives. He's showing them that he's the God who heals. And he makes a promise to them. Keep my, my commandments I'll, and I'll heal you. It's a conditional promise. God makes many conditional promises to us in his word. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 21, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I and the Father will love you, and I'll reveal or manifest myself to you. That's a promise. Keep my commandments. I'll show you more and more of who I am. Conditional promise. James chapter 4, resist the devil and he will flee. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a conditional promise. You draw near to me, I will draw near to you. He makes a promise here to them. He makes a promise in James chapter 1, right? Don't be hearers of the, of the word, but doers, lest you deceive yourself. Now, the man who's a hearer but not a doer, he's like the man who looks at his face in a mirror and walks away and forgets what kind of man he was. But the man who is not a forgetful hearer but a doer, who looks intently into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Bible, and continues in it, not a forgetful hearer, well, that man will be blessed in what he does. So if you're a doer of the word, ultimately you'll be blessed. Right? Conditional promises. See, God has given us his word. We take it, put it into practice in our lives, we apply it, and God does the work in our lives. And so, after he reveals himself, and he tests them, and he makes this promise to them, then in verse 27, they came to Elim, which means palms, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, and so they camped there by the waters. Now listen, he brings them from a bitter experience into a time of refreshing. This is an oasis. There's 12 wells of water. There's 70 palm trees, right? And after every bitter or mara experience, God will lead you into a time of refreshing. Acts 3.19, times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord, right? He's refreshing them now. This too shall pass. Whatever trial you're in, it'll pass. God will lead you out. He'll probably lead you into another one down the road, but <laughs> he'll lead you out, and he'll, and he'll give you a time of refreshing. 1 Peter 5, 10, 11 says, but may the God of grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God will do these things in your life. He'll perfect. He'll establish. He'll strengthen. He'll settle you. He'll always bring you out, and he'll never leave you, forsake you. He'll be with you through it all. So God is the same yesterday today and forever. And that same God that did all these things for Israel, he saved and he protected and he fought and he, uh, and he did miracles and he led and guided and, and all of these things, he'll do the same for us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He forgives, he restores. But remember, we're all in that process of transformation. He's conforming us into his image. What a great picture here of just the sovereignty of God and how he works. It's a real physical picture of the spiritual life that we have in Christ. Stay on the journey, keep walking with him, and trust him. But you have to know him to trust him. So set your heart on knowing him. And if you say, well, I know him, well, set your heart on knowing him more. And the more you know him, the more you'll trust him in everything. And if you don't yet know him, Look, there's going to be prayer partners up here in just a few minutes after this last song. Come on up and ask one of them to pray with you to receive Christ, to receive forgiveness for your sins and everlasting life and begin the journey with this God who is Almighty God, the one true and living God. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you so much for your word and the examples that we can take not only from Israel and how they responded to you, but just the pictures you give us of your, of your word, of who you are, your character, your nature, 
your divine providence in our lives. Help us, Lord, to trust you. Help us, Lord, to allow you to be Lord of our lives. Help us to know you better. And if there be any here that haven't given their lives to you yet, Lord, draw them unto yourself. Let today be the day of salvation for them. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.